and welcome to IKD webinar on gear replacement. I'm Mike Antwell. With me, I have two colleagues, and I'll let them introduce themselves. I'm Stephen Newberry. I work in the engineering department under Mike. I got my bachelor's and master's in engineering. Uh, after I graduated, I came on. I've been working with Mike for about three years now. I've got both experience with design and working in the field. I've, I've been out there collecting the measurements and details that we need to replace gears or design new ones, uh, and also the design process, uh, modeling it up and sending it out to our manufacturers. I've worked with everybody in here. I've got uh, some good knowledge I, I hope to share with you as well. Uh, I'm Ashley Triplett. I'm a key account specialist here, and basically what my role is is to make a single point of contact for the customer. So if you have engineering needs, parts replacement needs, field service needs, um, any anything pertaining to your rotary equipment, you just give me a call and I bring in the team, um, get everybody together so that we can work out a solution for you. Um, and Stephen, what you were talking about is you do that not just for gear sets, but for all parts, right? For all parts, all engineering. Today we're going to focus on gear sets in general, but uh, we focus on anything uh, rotary equipment related. You are correct. And again, I'm Mike Atwell. I've been uh, in the uh, oversee the engineering department here at Industrial Con Dryer. I've been doing machine design for over 30 years, and a lot of lean and other types of applications. We uh, pretty much replace any, like Stephen had mentioned, we work on any parts of the rotary equipment out there. Today, we're going to be talking about you know, gear replacements. He's being modest. He's actually the director of engineering. He has a fancy title. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> so one of the things about industrial cone dryers, we have nine degreed in-house engineers. We have two PhDs. As Stephen said, he has his master's. Where you got a, you know, we got engineers with PE license. We're not afraid to get out there, get in the field, and get dirty. In fact, most of us would rather be out in the field laying on the equipment because it's our playground and sit in the office. We go, we have a bunch of, you know, hands-on, plus we put the theory behind it. We have, you know, some of our people in our company here have 45 years working this equipment, and as Stephen mentioned, he's about three years on equipment. We're one of six companies that's owned by a single gentleman, and with all the companies combined, we have 25-degree engineers. So. If we haven't seen it or worked with it, or if we have any questions, we can reach out to the other organizations, and they can also give us a helping hand, and we also help them out with their questions. Yep. Yeah, if you look hard enough, you'll see me in the first photo down there. That's me working out the field, and in fact, actually doing a gear run out itself. So, uh, like Ashley said, Mike, he's the director, so a lot of times he'll be in the office, and he may send me out or some of the other engineers. We'll go out there, collect information, and relay uh, directly back to Mike. But like you said, I like getting out of the office, seeing new places, new plants, uh, just a new process. It's uh, with the knowledge to uh, physical form. It's always uh, great getting out of the office. And they're both really good teachers because sometimes I travel with them and they teach me new stuff every time. So gear sets, we get, often get people call us up and tell us, hey, you know, I got an eight foot unit, 40 feet long, and my gear's worn out, I want to order a gear. Well, we, you know, we talk to them and say, okay, well, the trouble is, is there's not a standard gear out there on a unit. There are endless designs of gears and different gear configurations. So the only way we can really go out and, you know, give you a good quote and for a replacement gear set is actually have somebody show up on site and take some key dimensions, and from there we can figure out what type of gear you have on it, what the dimensional sizes are. So there's many types of gear sets out there, and we design all gear sets for basically all rotary equipment, and it doesn't make any difference who the original manufacturer is of the gear. No, it, as uh, we'll talk about further, gears themselves are uh, kind of universal, so while there's many different designs going out there, we kind of hone down on what that exact design is, it's just by putting uh, hands on it, collecting the necessary information. Well, a lot of people have gears that have been on that piece of equipment for 30 or more years, mm -hmm. and the technology that was available 30 years ago 
maybe there was only this type or that type of mounting system or tooth shape gear, and now there's so many more options. So yeah. it's time for a gear replacement. You definitely want to speak with engineering and see Absolutely. what your options are. Yeah, because sometimes we'll go out and we may say, see what would be kind of described as a Frankenstein unit, one that's been built together with parts from this unit, that unit, some opinion that they found out in the graveyard. Uh, so it's uh, it, it's always important to get out there. We can identify if there's a, a design that needs to be improved on, or we can just go out there and copy the exact design that you have to replace the gear, make sure there's no uh, issues with um, uh, working with the current equipment that you have on the unit, uh, such as your drive system. Uh, so that, it's always great to get out there and hands on the unit to make sure we've done our due diligence. Yeah, one of the key things is when we go out there and we look at your gear, we want to know the history of the gear. What have you had issues with? How long has the gear been on? Has the gear been flipped? We can usually tell. But how long ago was it flipped? And how are you taking care of the gear? Because if we know if you have issues on, you know, say the mounting brackets, we can take a look at it and figure out why the mounting brackets aren't living up to the way they should. We can make, you know, design changes and make adjustments to those things as required. But without the history from you, it's hard for us to do an improvement to what your issues are that you're having on your gear. And uh, just another point on that, sometimes we've been out there and we've had customers that say, oh, we need a new gear. And we go out there and we tell them, well, it really doesn't look as bad as you think it is. And just sometimes going out there isn't just about selling you part. It's about the... Uh, uh, just giving you the, the engineering knowledge that we have, and we're not always out there trying to sell you something. So we'll go over a few of the common types of gears and mounting systems out there, because they're, they all kind of fall under a couple of different classifications. One of the most basic type of gear out there, which is the most cost-effective gear, is just a rectangular gear. It's basically a rolled ring with the gear teeth cut across it, and then there's lugs that are mounted on the side. Some people refer to them as chairs that go down well to the, the shell itself. That's really your low cost, quick option for a lot of units, and it performs very well. And some of the older, larger gears are some T-gears that are flange mounted. A lot of the older kilns, they have the gear stand off the shell, maybe two foot, two and a half feet, drag it away from some of the heat, and those are mostly mounted with flanges. And all your ball mills, pretty much, and your rod mills are all pretty much have a, a flange mounted gear on the end of the mill. And then in the last probably 25 years or so, a lot of T gears are coming out with spring mounting. That's really come out for, to replace a lot of the big flange gears on the kilns. So the spring mounts will allow for the thermal expansion of the kiln. So most of those gears are now being mounted on springs, lights or spring mounted. And then there are some old ball mills that have a trunnion mounted gear, which basically looks like an old style sprocket gear that goes on the end of the trunnion that then bolts on. We have a picture of those coming up. And then there's some gears on the, many, many years ago, they mounted a lot of gears right on the tire themselves. And then, you know, right now we still replace those. So we have to go back and reverse engineer what those mm -hmm. look like. Yep. Yeah. I've seen just about all those designs and uh, working with them. We can, uh, as Mike said, identify what you have out there and create that design for you. So on this slide here, we have a couple of different, uh, up here we have basically a, a more like a T-shaped gear that actually has side lugs and mounting on it. The center gear here is one design with just a regular flange that would mount onto a flange. And then one on their end is what we mounted on a, on the end of a trunnion shaft off of a ball mill. That was quite old itself that we are mm -hmm. designed to, be, to mount onto it. And then for the kiln gears, a lot of them are basically the leaf style or spring mounted gear that goes on the kiln shelf. It allows the kiln to thermally expand out and not put all that stress into the gear itself. That looks like, is that a um, two-piece, is that a two-piece gear? Yeah, most all the gears out here that we're working with are a two-piece gear or multi-piece gear segment. This one here is two pieces. 
that, that way you can, you know, put on both halves of, the, of your drum and pull it back together again, and I have to slide on from the end. But, yeah. but it is possible to do more than two pieces into a segmented gear, right? Yes. There's quite a few gears out there that are, you know, multiple pieces, and we're also working on a working with SEW that has multi-piece gears that would have, you know, maybe eight or nine parts to it. Well, the interesting thing about those is, is that if you, if one section of that gear is damaged in some way, you can replace just that segment, which is a really cool benefit of that. Right? Yes. For a short fix. And then with the gears, you got the pinions, and there's you know basically three different styles of pinions that are made. You got some pinions that are mounted directly on the shaft of the gear reducer, and those are usually on your smaller, lighter units. And there are a few that actually have an extended shaft out of the gear reducer, and they mount this pinion on that. And then on the outside end of that shaft, they put a bearing housing on it, and they support the end of the shaft then. The most common one out there for your, your large unit is a shaft mounted unit that is set up with two pillar block bearings on each side and your low speed coupling. Yeah, and in cases we've we've seen where the pinion's been mounted directly onto a, a gear reducer shaft. And in the case, we, we did our own uh, analysis of it and saw that that was more detrimental um, down on the gear reducer itself. So we, in cases, have redesigned to um, the model you see down there where it's supported uh, by the two bearings. And that, that the case helps with the overhung load. So a lot of times we're not out there just uh, uh, design liking kind. We'll go out there and identify what we see as issues uh, to help prevent any kind of uh, additional wear on your unit that's unnecessary. On gear measurements, like I mentioned at the very beginning, is if when somebody calls up and asks us to replace the gear for them, we need to go out in the field and get some dimensions. Sometimes we can take a lot of hand dimensions and get enough information off of that. And on other units, like the one here on the left of your screen, it's the end of a it's a uh, gear mounted at the end of a ball mill. To be able to design that, we need to know the exact location of all those flange holes. So with some of those locations, what we'll do is we'll go out with a total station and our spatial analyzing software and shoot the gear on the end of the drum so that the unit can be shut down. We can take some dimensional readings of it and go back in production while we go in and finish the design and then be able to manufacture the gear. Mm -hmm. In many cases on the ball mill though, we don't know what's on the back side of the flange. So in some cases we've got to take a section of it off, take a look at it, put it back on to you know, complete the design. Yep. Yeah, and so the benefit here, as Mike touched on, is that uh, while sometimes you do need to remove the gear, in this case, uh, we try what we can to uh, avoid that step in the process so that we don't interfere too much with the process you may have going on with the unit or um, uh, avoid any kind of uh, prolonged shutdowns. Just like we'll go out there with hand measurements, maybe shut the unit down for a short portion of the day. This uh, serves to do the same, uh, avoid any kind of unnecessary shutdowns on your end. We also can go out and take our 3D scanner and scan part of a gear or scan the whole gear. Here's an instance where somebody had sent an opinion. They didn't know what it was actually made to. So what we did was we took some hand measurements, but we also scanned the whole thing and brought it into the CAD model to get the exact dimensions on everything. Mm -hmm. So they sent this to us? Yes, this, this one here was actually sent to us, or it might have been on a customer site that we went out and scanned it. So you can do it while it's attached? We can do it while it's attached if it's clean enough. You know, we got to get all the grease and stuff off of it. This was a, a spare pin and they're going to get ready to install. So we went down there and, and scanned it before it was installed on the unit. So on this, when you went over to the shop to scan it, so from scanning it to this 3D image that you have, how much time does that usually take you? The scanning part usually takes anywhere from a half an hour to an hour to get everything set up and just scan the part. It really, an hour, hour is probably the longest generally it'll take. I, 
We actually have covered this in another seminar that I posted with uh, another colleague of mine, uh, Molly. Uh, she works in the junior department as well, but we discuss uh, the 3D scanning and the, hat, the manner in which we use that. But for this uh, particular case, I think she said it took her about 30 minutes to go out there and scan it. She'll take a raw file and then from there clean it up and have uh, the finished product you see on the screen. So it's a really helpful tool. We, we can use it uh, just beyond gears, uh, really any mechanical part that we can put our hands on and uh, visually see a majority of the, the part itself. We can uh, get some good information off of it with that tool. So we talked about the different shapes of gears. There's also different types of teeth that are cut on gears. Majority of the units out there on road equipment is just a spur gear, which is basically a straight cut across. It's the most economical cut to make on a gear. On some of the higher horsepower units, which is a lot of your ball mills and your real large kilns, they have a helical cut gear, which will actually give you a little bit more strength and transmit a little bit more horsepower across that gear set. And then in the real high horsepower units, and these are usually just used on the larger ball mills, you have a double helical, which basically the double helical, what it does is you can tell on, the, on a spur gear, you basically got a, a linear path for the forces to go through. On a helical, you're going to get some actual forces in the shaft, so you got to support your opinion for some thrust load, and it's going to see the transmit the power. And you go back to a double helical, it basically neutralizes the the thrust loads by having the double helical, so you don't have to worry about the thrust load on the, the shaft. The other thing that we got to look at on the, on the gear is the tooth size and the angle that's on the tooth. There's many, many different ways, or there's three main different ways to call out a tooth size. Majority of the stuff nowadays is called out as a diametral pitch. Long time ago, back 40, 50 years ago and earlier, they pretty much used a circular pitch, which was measuring the distance around the pitch of the gear. And then most of your European or your ISO gears or your DIN standard gears have a module, which is actually in millimeters. So when we go out and we take the measurements, we start looking at, you know, trying to calculate which size is the tooth that's currently on the unit. Is it a dimensional pitch? Is it a circular pitch or is it a module? Then with those, you have the different pressure angles that go with them. A lot of the older gears had a 14 and a half degree pressure angle. Majority of your gears now, I'd say 80% of the gears or more, have a 20 degree pressure angle. And then some of the newer gears that are out there have 25 degree pressure angle. And the different OEMs have come up with different ways and gear manufacturers have come up with different pressure angles. But the unit, pretty much the standard out there nowadays is a 20 degree pressure angle. So, Mike, sometimes uh, customers send in general arrangement drawings that they have from their OEM. This information here, is this usually listed on that GA drawing? Some of the times they have listed the information, some of the times they just give you the tooth count that's on the gear. From there, we can take that and work backwards and try to figure out which size tooth it's on there. There's been times where they've given us actually a information on the GA drawings and we do the calculation, it does not match up with what the unit really is. Mm -hmm. So on some of the drawings we've seen in the past, it's actually misinformation that they give us, which is quite interesting. We've almost got caught before making the wrong size gear because the information we got, they said, well, here's all the gear information. This is what we need. And when we ran the numbers, it's like, well, wait a minute, it won't fit your unit. There's not something not quite right there. So if, if we just taken their information from their drawing, we'd have been a gear that would not have worked. Yep. So we always validate what's given to us. Mm -hmm. yep. We have a customer right now, Stephen, you just went a couple of weeks ago. Um, they had a uh, very limited description of their gear. They also had a gear set on the bone yard that they thought they could reuse. And so it, the visit was twofold in that you were measuring the gear in the bone yard to verify if it would fit that kiln, which it did not. And then the other was to gather all the specs and dimensions for that gear so that you could draw it up to specifications. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Great trip. 
Yeah, in fact, uh, a lot of times whenever a customer provides me with any information, I'll, I'll take that um, for what they, they've given me. But when I go out there, I'll, I'll measure up everything myself because I, I, when I'm out there, I treat it as if I have no knowledge I, I, of what was given to me. I collect all the information and then validate it when I come back to the office. In this case, I believe I, I collected information on a coupling that wasn't quite correct. So it's just good to have those checks because a lot of these units could have been built somewhere in the 50s or earlier and it's been replaced several times. So you go back and grab the drawings in. It's not necessarily that it likes the equipment that's on there today. Um, and sometimes that information just doesn't get caught in the paper trail. Uh, that's, that's why it's important uh, to just go out there, put your hands on it. Uh, and I always uh, try to collect as much information as I can. It, it, it pays off a lot of times. Want to know something crazy? What's that? One time, several years ago, I had a customer in uh, Mississippi called, and they said they had a gear in their phone yard. Yeah. And they had eight units, but they weren't sure which unit it went to. So we um, went down there and we measured it and it didn't belong to any of those units. Yeah. It came from one of their plants in Georgia. Really? And so it was obviously a good trip. And then they measured the unit for the gear that they needed. So yeah. engineering trips are very important. Absolutely. Yeah. And on the same note, I've seen where customers, uh, I suppose they did their own replacement. They took spare pinion from another unit completely different size, possibly different, uh, uh, as Mike said, diametral pitch or uh, circular pitch, different design all around, and just placed it as a uh, replacement on that unit, uh, maybe a short-term fix, and ran with it for several years, then sent that opinion into us saying this is what they needed a uh, replacement of. And when we actually went out there to, again, our hands on, we saw that it, it wasn't a match. We had two different gear sets here. Uh, so it, it really would have it, it would have been unfortunate to go out there, design a new opinion for them, have them pay for it, and then it not work. So just a second set of eyes that has uh, some knowledge to put behind it, it always serves a benefit. And also, with some of the equipment that we have on some of these larger units, it's hard to get a gear count or a tooth count. On the gears when you got gear guards on them. But with one of our sensors, we can actually get a tooth count on the gear while it's running. We're not having to shut down the unit. We've done that a few times. So once we get all the information on a gear and we start designing the gear, we know what the tooth angle is, we know what type of tooth profile it is, we know the face width, we know the material we're going to make it out of. We run it through the ANSI and AGMA standard. AGMA is the American Gear Manufacturers Association. There are a bunch of people that have been making gears over time. I think the organization's been around a very, very long time. But they go through, and a lot of them are gear manufacturers, actually, the guys that are making the gears. Some of them are from some of the big OEM manufacturers, also. So we run with it. There's lots and lots of factors that go into this equation, as you can see. The first equation basically calculates what the piston fitting resistant power rating is. And that is to keep the gears from actually, you know, falling on each other and causing a little pitch to come on the gear. The second one is a bending stress power rating. In the old days in the past, a lot of the cast gears, they weren't handled the bending very loads very good. So that was a critical calculation to do. Today, most of the limiting factors come in across the fitting resistance. Mm -hmm. That has something to do with the design of it, power rating, also the lubrication that you use on the gear set. I have nothing to add there. <laughs> <laughs> but we always do. We would try to run through there and check and make sure that you know it is the appropriately designed gear with the horsepower rating that's going to be used for. One of the things we find is we go out there and we the customer wants a new gear set. And we go out there and we get the new gear out there and we design it all up. Then when we look at their drive base and their drive system, it is very old and antiquated. It's rusting apart. It's not tied down good to the base. And the pinion's moving around some, and they can't adjust it very easily to keep a good contact with the gear. And all you're doing is taking a good investment, and now you're going to shorten the life of the gear set dramatically by not keeping the pinion tied down and anchored. 
So if you do have an older drive system, older gearbox that's large, then sometimes what we want to do is make sure that it is anchored good. We may want to consider changing out the whole package at one time. Mm -hmm. On this next slide here, we have an example where it's an older system and it's one that uh, the pinion is actually mounted mm -hmm. on the back side of the gearbox. The gear goes down through, you can't quite see it. But the pinion is mounted on the gearbox and this drive system has been around a while. And the drive base is not a very secure base. And when we play the video, if you watch the gearbox here, you actually be able to watch it actually moving around. So you can watch it bounce around. Now, this, this is the this is using our motion amplification software. So the amount you're seeing it moving is not what you'd see with a naked eye. What you're seeing moving is is a few thousands left and right, but that's all going to it's all going to add up to the wear of the gear and on the pinion. So if you do have an older system, you may want to look at, you know, changing out the whole drive system. Yeah. yeah. And that, while that doesn't seem significant, that little bit of shaking, if that 10 years of cycling uh, and loading it down, that wear will eventually uh, affect the components within the gearbox itself. And that, that can be a, a pricey fix when all really needed to do was uh, uh, maybe secure the base a little bit uh, more. In fact, in that design, we, we really wouldn't follow along with something like that. Mike has some uh, examples on the next slide. Generally, we would try to grout that base down, almost glue it to the pier so that we know we have a solid foundation uh, that hasn't been compromised by uh, maybe broken components or uh, pier top that's been saturated with oil. So that's, that's one. It's really uh, important to, while you're replacing your gears, if there's a lot of wear on it, identify maybe where that wear is coming from. Uh, it also maybe take the time to uh, prevent future uh, break it, breaks in your system. If you have, uh, on some system, people will say, well, my, my high-speed coupling keeps wearing out. Mm -hmm. And they say, we go out there and we check the alignment of the coupling. Well, in this case, the alignment can be absolutely perfect on the coupling. But when you run the unit with a gearbox vibrating back and forth, you're putting a lot of actual load back and forth in that coupling that's going to wear it out. Mm -hmm. So if you're wearing out couplings and something's not quite right with your drive system, either alignment or you got some vibration and you don't, that's doing damage to mm -hmm. so. And each one of these is, every customer is different. There's no um, black and white way to do it. It's different for every single person, which is why it's beneficial to have a team like these guys working on your project to help figure out what's the best solution for you, what's, what's a design that will favor um, your process and, and make your equipment more efficient. Yep, that's correct. Uh, you know, every unit is uh, moving through a different process depending on what, uh, what kind of product you have in there. So that it's running at different speeds or maybe it runs at different intervals uh, and different lengths of time uh, throughout the day. So that's going to affect what kind of motor you've got, what kind of redu reductions you have in your gearbox, and then ultimately the gear so you're between that Indian gear. That's all information that we'll collect and then use as design parameters when creating a new drive base. We're not going to go try to source that 60, 50 year old motor and gearbox that you have in there. We'll look for the newer components. Uh, generally, a lot of times those can be more uh, compact uh, to which serves benefits and save space. Uh, it will design the, the base around that. As you see on the screen, Mike has there right now, that's the case. We started off with a gear and pinion replacement but then talk about the benefit that would be had with uh, replacing the the drive base all together as one package, and uh, so far the unit itself runs significantly better without any kind of vibration, which we suspected was causing wear the components and the um, gear set itself. So is this base right here in this picture that is what you re went in and replaced it with? Correct. Yeah, the, the original design was much larger. Um, it took about the entire pier. That's what I designed using minimum amount of material because we, we really, you know, sent some waste and all that 
metal just to cover the pier top. Uh, so I designed it around the components. It's designed to move all as one unit, the motor, the gearbox, and the pinion, as well as move the pinion individually to adjust that gear run out and the, the meshing between the, the pinion and gear. So we that, that's also beyond the design, the manufacture, or uh, fabricating of these gears. We'll also have a team to see there uh, of our field employees that will go out there and build it from the ground up and install that for our customers. And uh, they're always uh, they're always great with the, the work that they do out there. They um, we work directly with them. We'll take visits to them and make sure that uh, everything's installed properly. So you designed this? Yep, actually I, I designed that one. Uh, went and saw it from the ground up, and it uh, works properly. It's perfect. It's great. So how was the customer amazed at how much smaller the footprint was? Yep, yeah. So in fact, we're going out there. To, we've done I think two, three ball mills out there. So they, they obviously don't hate it. But uh, were they no, kind of scared at first? Because well, I've had a couple where when the footprint is smaller, they're like, "Well, yeah. we did something wrong. This doesn't." This doesn't fit. This is too small. Exactly. A customer may say, well, you know, the previous motor I had was three times as large as that, which with small motors are going to be able to spin my unit. We explained, you know, 50 years, a lot of times you'll see just like a cell phone, it's like technology shrinks. So. We said bigger is not always better. Not always better. <laughs> no. In fact, I, it's easier to move around and uh, work with those smaller components generally. Um, so. Uh, it's it's always great to uh, get out there and try to continually update your system. You don't want to wait until something breaks and then try to be replacing a uh, system that's compatible with a six-year-old motor that you can't source anymore. Right. Yeah. Uh, if you go through now, you won't have to uh, chop up your uh, your system so much and try to accommodate these old parts. If you're if you have the time uh, and the resource to do a lot of maintenance on it all at once. It's uh, the recommended uh, choice. One of the things we see out there is people will grab, find an old unit, move it into their operation, and then they try to put something together quickly to drive the unit. Nothing's really designed as a holistic package. It's what they had to deal with. And it's worked very well for most of the customers over time. And over time, things you know start falling apart. And when it's time to go back and change it, you're better off you know, changing out the complete package and design the system to work with each other. That's not that's not really like the cell is not the goal. The goal is efficiency. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. you have to spend a little money to be a little bit more efficient, but in the long run, you're gonna save more money. Exactly. And like I'm as we said, an engineer, I'm not a salesman. I I would you know, I'd be making zero sales if I was out there. So I had to do that. <laughs> Uh, so the the way if if I explain to you the need and with the uh, impacts sticking with maybe these older components will have that's my part of the sale it's it's uh, how it'll benefit your unit if you don't see the benefit that I do then maybe it's not necessary but a lot of times that's uh, going out there saying okay yeah our components are wearing down but this is probably why your unit's got all this vibration it's going to continually break down and while we could probably sell you more parts down the line because it continually breaks down we'd rather just go and say here's the issue we see if you do this we may be able to knit that but sometimes you gotta spend money and make money exactly yeah our, our main goal is to solve the customer's problem mm -hmm. whatever issues they're having we want to try to eliminate those issues yeah you know, before they have you know as much uptime as possible exactly so, you know, we've talked about gears, we've talked a little bit about the drive base and stuff, but, you know, also once you make the investment on putting a new gear on your unit, it's not a cheap investment and it takes some time, so you lose some, you know, production time as it's being installed. You ought to protect your investment, throw a gear guard on your, on over your unit. There are some places that maybe not as required, but 90% of the time, 95% of the time, you should have a gear guard over your gear. Mm -hmm. To protect it from the elements, to protect it from particles and dust running around, and also, you know, in some cases, if the unit's down small, low enough on the floor, you need it. You know, it's required by you know OSHA to have you know protection around the you know, pinch points. 
But you know, we ought to have a gear guard put on your gear to help protect everything. And then you go from being a very complex gear guard to a very simplified gear guard, depending on what type of uh, protection we're trying to give the gear. Yeah, and like Mike said, it's always important. If, if you can go out to your unit and say that there's absolutely no product anywhere that's flying around in the air, that's great. But generally when we go out there, we'll see product that's just kind of uh, maybe leaking around there's always other issues. And if that gets in the, the lubrication itself and starts uh, um, getting on the gear, it can cause pitting issues or uh, just uh, all around meshing uh, for the gears. And the last thing we want to do is wear out your gear as soon as it needs to. So Mike, this one, uh, this one here on the right, that was customized for that particular customer. Um, because they had a dual pinion system, but even though the basic, I guess, the basic uh, components of a guard are kind of all the same, it can be customized however they like. Almost every gear guard we do, every every gear guard we do is customized. They're, we've never made sure I like yet because every unit's different, and every mounting system's different, and bases are different. The top portion we use the same concepts a lot of times in the designs. When we get down to the base, everyone's usually very unique for that particular customer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're always dealing with different clearance issues, uh, just different size units. We have some that have pull-out trays in the bottom, so they can pull them out, and people can go to carry it out mm -hmm. to dump it out. We have, you know, custom inspection doors in there, places you put in your grease spray system. Sometimes that are on the door, sometimes they're on the back side spraying the gear, sometimes they're on to spray the pinion. Mm -hmm. So in conclusion, what we'd like to tell you is that we are your solution provider for your gear replacement. We can come out, we can troubleshoot. You know, a lot of customers, like we've said, they call us up and say, I have this old unit, I have no drawings, I have no documentation for it. My gear is about worn out, I'm getting nervous here, what can you do for us? Well, we can go out there, we can take some key dimensions, we can, you know, design a replacement gear for you. If you got a drive system, that's got vibration stuff in it. We can do an analysis on your drive system, find out what's moving, what's not moving. Do you need to replace it? You just need to get it anchored down solid. You know, wh what is wrong with it? You don't always need to replace your drive base mm -hmm. for your drive system. But, you know, if it's giving you problems, let's take a look and get that resolved. And then once you spend all that money, let's go and protect your, your gear with the gear guard. And as Stephen mentioned earlier on some of the slides, it showed us some pictures of some of our guys. We actually have crews that go out there and remove and install, it, remove the old gear and or drive base and then reinstall the new systems. Yep. We'll see the issue from uh, the design all the way to installation. And we'd be happy to help you with any of that. So if you're having any issues, you have any questions, give us a call. We'd love to talk to you. Um, we'd love to see what you guys are working with. So please um, don't hesitate to contact us. We're here to help you. Absolutely. Or you have somebody that answers the phone 24 hours a day. If you have an emergency down, if you got a gear issue or a problem with it, call up and they'll get in contact with the appropriate people and we'll get back in touch with you. We've had people call us up where they've stripped out gears and, you know, we've worked with them to get something up there to get the unit up and running as quick as possible. Thank you. Again, as Ashley mentioned, if you've got any questions, you know, if there's our contact information, give us a call. You can send in any uh, questions to the contact at industrialcone.com and we'll get, get you an answer. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Thank for you, everybody. For watching the uh, webinar. Have a great day.